folks, it appears we've reached the appointed hour. Uh, thank you for your presence. You know, quite a group out there. And, of course, this time I think we have ample room to get everybody in. If there's anybody standing outside, go get them and bring them in. But anyway, at this time, uh, just before we just give you some idea of what we're going to be doing, please, the thing here, the central theme is going to be keeping a civil attitude, and we're going to try to keep down any commotion whatsoever that we can. Now, the layout here is going to be fairly simple. We've got about uh, three cases here before we get to the, uh, the case with the quarry. So we're going to go ahead and dispense with those. And another thing that I will do, and I'll ask the uh, commissioners here, we're not going to have municipal comments, constitutional officer comments, or department head comments uh, tonight. But if you would, just please be civil. Pay attention to uh, the people's feelings and the folks around you. And we'll go ahead and get started at this time. I'd like to ask you all to rise, and we'll have our invocation. Please, any electronic devices, please make sure those things are turned off. We don't want to hear those. Please bow with me at this time. Oh, Father, we just come before you, just always, Lord, asking your blessing and guidance on all that we say, all that we do, Lord. And, Father, we just ask that all tensions be relieved and that we could just uh, speak uh, freely with open hearts. And, Lord, that we could uh, just conduct this in the most civil way that we possibly can. The Lord, as always, just forgive us where we fail you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Now for our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Commissioners, just as a quick reminder, as we adopt this agenda, I, uh, I want to dispense with municipal comments, constitutional officer comments, and department head comments. With that being said, do I hear a motion we adopt the agenda? Is there a second? All in favor? So passes. You've had an opportunity to review the minutes from October the 10th, our uh, regular meeting at 9 a.m., do I hear a motion those minutes be accepted as presented? Is there a second? Is there any discussion on those minutes? Das, I'm asking for a vote now. All in favor? We have accepted those minutes. No municipal comments, no constitutional officer's comments, no department head comments. So that brings us up to our public hearing part of the agenda. Do I hear a motion we go into public hearing? Is there a second? All in favor? We're in public hearing at this time. And I'm going to ask Mr. Ron Garrett if he would present case number 12. Okay. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Hey, commissioners, we've got, uh, we've got three cases here, or four cases. We're going to dispense with the first three uh, before we get to uh, case 14. Case number 12 comes from uh, Buddy L. Crooks. He's an agent for Lane Crowder Porter, and he is requesting approval to rezone a .25 acre lot from rural residential to commercial for the purpose of opening a general store in an existing commercial building. The building was built in 1960 and was used as a country store for many years. The building has been vacant for several years, and now Mr. Buddy Crooks and his wife want to restart a small general store business in the Duran community. The property is located on Silver Street in Duran. The County Health Department has approved a septic tank system for the business. The Duran community is designated as a crossroad community in the County Comprehensive Plan and the character area map. This is the type of land use and activity that is recommended in the Comprehensive Plan for this character area. It is my recommendation that the zoning request be approved. That also is the same uh, re recommendation from the County Planning Commission. 
You don't see the map where this property is located? Yes, I did earlier. Commissioners, are there questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see that. Okay, commissioners, is there additional questions you might have there? At this time, is there anyone else that wishes to speak on this particular case? Is there anything you'd like to add before you, we begin to ask questions? Commissioners, they're open for questions. Are there any questions? Is there anybody else who would like to speak on this particular issue? Looks like the ball's back in our court. Ms. Beth, I believe this is your district. You're absolutely right. I was not thinking. Uh, at this time, we will have to go out of public hearing. Do I hear a motion that we go out of public hearing? Is there a second? All in favor? Okay, Ms. Beth, I'll pass it over to you now. So this is in my district. Um, there is no opposition to this request from those who live in the area, so I make a motion to approve the request. I have a motion and a second from Commissioner Threadgill. Any further discussions, Commissioners? Then I'd like to go ahead and press this for a vote. All in favor? So passes. Thank you, folks. Uh, do I hear a motion? We go into public hearing for case number 13. Is there a second? All in favor? We're in public hearing at this time. Mr. Garrett. Okay, case number 13 comes from Miss Lillian Dunn Hightower, along with her sister, May Edna Dunn Mons. And they are requesting approval to rezone four acres of their 60 acres from A1 to RD. The property is located at 2131 J.W. Dunn Road. The reason for the rezoning request is to sell 56 acres of their air property and keep four acres and an existing vacant house, which is their home place. This zoning request will not adversely affect any of the surrounding properties and is consistent with the county company's plan and character area map. Um, at the public hearing, Ms. Hightower was present, and uh, she found out that she sells, uh, keeps only four acres that will breach her conservation use on the property. So at the, public, the planning commission public hearing, she asked the planning commission to approve her for, to rezone 12 acres. That way she can keep her 12 acres in conservation use. And uh, the planning commission approved that request. And so that's what the request is now, that she be allowed to rezone 12 acres from A1 to now it will be RR. Uh, Ms. Beverly, do we have anybody else signed up on this? I just 
just wanted to go ahead and get my ducks in a row. Let's see, you're Mrs. Hightower. Correct? Yes, I am. Would you like to speak? Go ahead. Yes, I really thought that what I requested was to rezone all of it. That yes. was the request when I came down here to Greenville. Well, the, the minutes reflect you found out that you would breach the covenant use if you only rezone four acres. Right. And then we uh, was made clear to you that you would have to have at least 12, 12 acres. Right, that I would have to keep 12 acres. Right, that's right, keep 12 acres with the home place. Right. And then but, you would sell the remainder of the property. But we thought that we were rezoning all of it. We thought that we were rezoning all of it instead of just 12 acres. That's right. Where are you want to sell? Your application reflects that you want to sell all but twelve acres. That's, that's right. But the person that's buying it is not. Uh, she'll have to come and rezone it herself. The person that's buying it. Not if they're going to buy the whole track. They would have to continue the Kuva um, the application that you're under which I think is about six or seven years in, uh, but if they're willing to do that, there would not be a breach, and if they're buying the entire track, there would really be no reason for need to rezone. Yes. I still want to keep 12 acres sell the rest of it. Well, I want to rezone all of it. I don't know what, or I don't know what the letters mean or whatever. Uh, there's no reason to rezone it. It's in... Right. There's no reason to rezone it? You, uh, well, you said you wanted to rezone the entire track. Uh-huh. You only need to rezone 12 acres that you're going to keep. And what happened to the other part? The other part will just remain in A1. It'll, stay, it'll, it'll just keep its current zoning, which is A1, agriculture. And if somebody buys that part of the property and they want it rezoned for some reason, then they have to go through the same rezoning process that you're going through. Okay, so... Okay, I already know that they, want it, they don't want to keep it in agriculture. I already know that. So then this won't take care of all of it? Well, if they don't want to keep an agriculture, that's their choice, but they don't have to do any rezoning at all. That's right, it will. It will result in a breach for you. And that's substantial being that you've been in the I guess I really don't understand because I've already paid to have it all rezoned. The, whoever buys the property left over, they can elect to put it in uh, conservation. And then that way it would not affect you. They don't want it in conservation. That's what I'm saying. They don't, I mean, what they wanted, they, they don't want it in agriculture. Well, the, the conservation and agriculture zone are two different things. Okay. Uh, do you know why they don't want to keep it in agriculture? Right, because they're not going to farm or they're not going to do anything they're going to build. Okay. They don't have to farm, they can build. But the if they don't elect to keep that remaining property in conservation, then it, it's going to breach your covenant. Okay. That, well, now, she does want to keep it in conservation. The remaining property? Right. Okay. Well, she'll have to sign up with the tax assessors, and if they agree to keep it in conservation, then it won't affect you either. Okay, it so, won't be a breach. So we're okay with this? Yes. But okay. they will have to sign up for conservation, the okay. new buyer, new owner. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Hightower. Is there anyone else who wants to speak on this? Um, Ms. Hightower, um, obviously there's a little bit of confusion on what, what uh, you need to do to be able to take care of what you want to take care of. Uh, with the board's blessing, we could continue this uh, to our next meeting and give you an opportunity to come in and sit down with um, uh, Ms. Garrett and myself, and we could kind of go over what, what you want to do with this, okay. and then we can bring that back uh, to the next meeting if you'd like to do that, and then the board's okay with that. Okay, I would. No, I don't want to do that. But uh, I just thought when I came in and paid the money to rezone that that took care of all of the 60 acres. That's what I was uh, under the impression of. But that's not how it worked. Oh, okay. No, I don't. No. Okay. Thank you. Well, with the confusion, let's go ahead and come out of public hearing. Do I hear a motion? Is there a second? All in favor? At this time, it sounds like, Ms. Hightower, we're going to continue this until the next meeting or another meeting of your choice. Is that correct? I think that's what. Do I hear a motion that we continue? November the 14th. November the 14th will be your date to continue. Is that okay with you? Okay. Do I hear a motion then that we continue to November the 14th on case number 13? Is there a second? All in favor? Case, conti case continue. Case number 15. Uh, do I hear a motion we go into public hearing? Is there a second? All in favor? Okay, Mr. Ron. Case number 15 is a rezone application that comes from Mr. Michael Dover. He's requesting approval to rezone two acres of his six acres from LDR to RD. The property is located at the dead end of Red Lane, which is off of Mount Carmel Road. Uh, the property west of and adjacent to the subject property is owned by the Georgia DNR, is used as a wildlife reserve. Uh, the reason for the rezoning request is to deed two acres to his father to build a single family residence for his father's use. There are four families that live on this dead end road. Okay. Looks like the road just dead ends to your property right there. It does. Um, it'll be, uh, actually it's uh, 
the property just north of it that's currently owned by uh, Mr. Scoggin, but my daughter's buying that property, so it'll dead end into her property. And then there's a 50-foot uh, easement over to the uh, WMA. They use it once every 10 years to get trees out. Anybody else wish to speak on this particular case? Commissioners, are there any questions? Is there a second? I make a motion that we approve the rezoning and the recommendation of the Planning Commission. And I'm familiar with your area. Thank you for coming into Maryville County. I have a motion and I believe I have a second. Any further discussion? Okay, let your vote be a show of hands. Do you approve? All right. That ends that, and thank you, Mr. Dover. Mr. King. Uh, Mr. King, I, I've got your name in pencil, but this type sure stands out more. <laughs> thank you, Mr. King. Thank you. Before we get into case number 14, there's a couple of things here that I need to run over that I've been asked to do. And you've heard this drill, so I will be very quickly with it. Uh, we're going to be conducting, of course, this regular meeting as we go through, and we're going to allow a reasonable time to address all the agenda items, but we will always conduct this meeting and conduct ourselves in a very professional manner. Everyone is to be respectful of each other. The commission board, the person who is speaking, whether you agree or do not agree, no loud outburst, please talking over anyone, unfounded allegations, or any conduct that disrupts the process of the meeting. If anyone fails to follow these rules, I will have to call you out of order. If the conduct continues, I will ask that you be removed. I will also ask the commission board uh, to hold your comments until after everyone has had an opportunity to speak, unless you have a question for the staff. On the quarry, Randall Brothers rezoning, we will allow each side 30 minutes and five minutes each for rebuttal. Now there's a sign up sheet here for those wishing to speak. What I think we probably need to do is uh, go ahead and gather those up at this time and let me see those and see how we can divvy this out. Now understand we're saying that there'll be 30 minutes for each side with a five minute rebuttal that will take place later. Are there questions on that? Yes, sir. That, yes, sir, we, we had 60 minutes from one side, 50 minutes from the other side, and we thought uh, it would be best to just allow 30 minutes for each side. Yes, sir, we did. We got your request. Sure did, sir. Any further questions? I was just going over these names, now I'll recite, I'll recite these for you in just a second. But at the end of the 30 minute segments, that'll be one for each side, we're going to have a short break and then we'll come back in for rebuttals. Uh, in the on the uh, in favor side, 
Mr. Jerry Fitzgerald, Mr. Bob Norman, and Bubba Allen. That's the ones I'm showing. Is that correct with you, sir? Hold on just for a minute before you rise. I'm going to go over both. Uh, for the opposed side, I've got Tyler Donstack and Tyler. Are y'all going to speak together? or I mean, either one of you wants to occupy the space. Is that correct? Okay. Gene King, you will be allowed there. And PJ, I assume that's Calhoun. Am I right in that? Is there any uh, order in which you'd like to speak? Now understand, again, this entire, everyone speaking, it's 30 minutes. Y'all divvy it up like you want to. Uh, on behalf of the applicants, speak, those speaking in favor, Mr. Chairman, we'd like Mr. Allen to go first, Mr. Fitzgerald, and myself last. Oh, okay, let me write that down. Mr. Stack, how did you want to go? Thank you, Mr. McCoy. Um, I think you missed one name on there, and I don't know if it's maybe because my writing may have been illegible. Uh, Eddie Hinton, H-I-N-T-O-N. Maybe Tyler's writing was illegible. Oh, okay, there is one up here at the top. You, Eddie Hinton is who you want to yes. be one. All right, what's your order? And how so would you like our, these people call? Our order would be Gene King, um, Mr. Hinton, Mr. Calhoun, and then I'll bat clean up. Oh, okay, sir. Thank you. Okay. Again, I want to go over this one more time. The cumulative amount of time is 30 minutes. Y'all got that, right? Okay. Uh, is there any order in which you would like to speak? I mean, as far as which one of you speaks first? You want the opponent to go first? The proponent. Okay, I was just getting my, my uh, advice here. Proponent? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, do you want the staff to, uh, to make our presentation? Oh, I'm sorry. Please relax until the staff, you're right, I forgot about that. Mr. Theron will go ahead and introduce this and give you a little bit of an update. Uh, I don't think I need an introduction, but you go right ahead, Mr. Theron. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Garrett's going to go ahead and, and start out. Enter in. We need to go into public hearing session, though, to be able to. Uh, oh, you're absolutely right. I have failed to do that. Let's, commissioners, we need to go into public hearing. Do I hear a motion? Is there a second? All in favor? We're now in public hearing. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, case number 14. Uh, this is the Meriwether County Planning. The Meriwether County Planning Zone Department has received a request for rezoning of a special use permit on a 775 plus or minus acre tract owned by Luella H. Randall et al., trustees of Luther Randall Jr. Trust. The property is located along State Route 85 and State Route 362 in the Alberton community, identified on tax map number 164-06. The property is vacant and is currently zoned low-density residential. The request from the applicant is to rezone the 775 more or less acres from low-density residential to industrial and request a special use permit to allow the development and operation of a granite quarry. The application provides a summary as well as more detailed information on the proposed project. The application also provides information on granite resources, proposed material shipment methods, conceptual site plan, rail spurs, economic benefits, permit requirements, air quality, water quality, noise, blasting, and transportation impacts, and offers opinions on impacts to the surrounding properties. A copy of the summary and conceptual site plan is provided for each one of the commissions, and the complete application is available for review. It's my recommendation on this rezone request is based on an extensive review of the application information provided, as well as research conducted by county staff. Consideration of the following standards for the exercise of zoning power as found in Meriwether County Zoning Ordinance, Appendix A, Article 16, Section 16.8, uh, were looked at and considered in, in reviewing this 
application. I read the entire staff report at the last public hearing, but we're not going to do that tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Theron Gay for him to summarize the application. Go ahead, Mr. Gay. Uh, thank you, Ron. <clears throat> um, again, as Ron has previously said, you have a copy of this in your packet, and uh, the staff recommendation is the same as what was presented to the Planning Commission. You could read this again if you, if, if you would like. But if it's okay with the board, what we'd like to do is just summarize it. And then we'll make, of course, this packet and the uh, uh, report a part of the records. There are several things that we have to consider in uh, when you start looking at, at uh, rezoning of property and exercise of zoning power. Uh, and these factors were considered. The existing land uses and zoning classification of nearby property. We also considered the suitability of the subject property for the zone purpose the extent that the property values of the subject property are diminished by the particular zoning restrictions, and the extent that the destruction of property values of the subject property promotes the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the public. We considered the relative gain to the public as compared to the hardship opposed upon the individual property owner. We considered whether the subject property has a reasonable economic use as currently zoned. We considered the length of time the subject property has been vacant as zoned, considered in the context of land development in the area and vicinity of the property. We also considered whether or not the proposed zoning will uh, be a use that is suitable in view of the use and development of adjacent and nearby property, and whether or not the uh, proposed zoning will adversely affect the existing use or usability of adjacent nearby property. Another factor was whether or not the zoning will result in um, a use which will or can cause an excessive or burdensome use of existing streets, transportation facilities, utilities, or school. And whether or not the zoning proposal is con in conformity with the policies and intent of the land use plan. Um, other factors uh, also were that whether or not there were other existing or changing conditions affecting the use and development of the property which gives supporting grounds for either approval or disapproval of the zoning proposal. Now, if the industrial, uh, this, this requires also, because if industrial zoning is, is requested, but they're also requesting a special use permit, then there's additional criteria that we have to consider when looking at a special use permit. And that is uh, the availability of existing street system is adequate to uh, effect, uh, effectively and efficiently, uh, rather, and safely accommodate the traffic that will be generated by the proposed use of development. The existing public utilities, facilities, and services are adequate to accommodate the proposed use or development. The use of the development will not generate or cause conditions such as noise, light, glare, or an odor, or similar uh, objectionable features uh, which could reduce the value, use, or enjoyment of surrounding properties, and the use uh, would not have a detrimental environmental impact on the surrounding area. And uh, lastly, the use would not uh, adversely affect the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the community. After uh, staff did an extensive review of uh, the application and the information and research, uh, the recommendation came back that, the, um, that Ron and his staff and county staff uh, recommend for denial of the requested rezoning and special use permit. Now we have six reasons we've listed. Those are part of your, um, of your uh, packet. And this was also the recommendation of the Planning Commission as well. Now we also noted that should the Planning Commission and or the county commissioners choose to approve the request, the county staff has um, recommended 23 conditions that would need to be added should the commissioners choose to approve the request. But again, the, the recommendation of county staff and the recommendation of the planning commission is for denial of the requested rezoning and the special use permit. And I'll be happy to answer any questions the board has. Does that include our staff comments? Is that everything now? Is that concluded? That's yes, sir. That's everything that we have from our report at this time. Okay. At this time, we'll be hearing from the in favor. 
And uh, the clock starts now. Who's keeping my time? You got that? Skip's got it? Okay. If you would, Mr. Bubba Allen, please come to the mic. No, we're, we'll give you time to get to that mic there. I'm Bob Allen. I'm from Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, not a native of Maryville County. I'm going to be short, Bob. Don't worry. I 30 minutes ain't a lot of time to say what needs to be said about this quarry. But I'm not, a, I'm not a native, like I said. I moved here in the early 80s, mid-80s. I uh, left here for a few years and took care of my grandparents back home. But I found this on social media, and that's a terrible place to argue about this. I've never been involved in anything like this on social media. I thought social media was for finding girlfriends and cars. So uh, it's kind of been a, a first time for me, but I do know about quarries. I've hauled from quarries, and actually that's the reason I made a comment. I've seen some claims on there about the Flint River going dry, that they were going to frack, that uh, Everybody was going to die of cancer, I, I, all kinds of things, and I think that's our biggest problem here. There's some untruths going on. Where we're relying on some bad information here. My grandparents were in their 70s, and they built a quarry 200 yards from their front door, and they were worried. My grandfather wasn't as worried as my grandmother. He sold them the land, and they put a quarry. This is Cherokee, North Carolina, and I still own the property since they passed away. They lived, both lived in their 90s. We never, they were the best neighbors we ever had. We had the best darn driveway in that part of the state. They took care of the roads. They checked on my grandfather when I wasn't up there. They was, uh, I never heard blasting up there. I mean, we're 200 yards away. You might feel a little, once a week, once every two weeks, you might feel a little something. But these people, they, these quarries, their water, we never had no water problems, which you don't have with a granite quarry. I knew all this, so I made a comment. I wasn't real popular with the folks in the blue shirts, and I understand that, and I don't blame them. But I also, i done some research. When you look at all the quarries across the United States, Less than 3% of them have ever had a problem with a neighbor. And of that 3%, if you take the limestone quarries out, which is a granite quarry, we're talking around 2%. There's never been a case that I could find in the state of Georgia of a granite quarry causing a problem with a well. There's been a quarry in operation in the state of Georgia since the 1870s. And that quarry is still in operation in Stockbridge, Georgia, and it's, they're quite popular in that community. They generate a lot of income. And I, I'm, I've heard, I mean... The Flint River is not going to go dry. It's not. They, there's no pollution going to pile into Flint and seal it up. Hadn't we been mining the Flint for years? I mean, what's been on in Molina for all these years? We're digging the sand out. So, to me, this is a perfect industry. I don't see the negatives in this whatsoever. I mean, it's not going to be a, a Kia plant by no means, but it's a start. And I know the budget that y'all are working with, and I know what this town looks like compared to what it looked like when I come in the 80s, and I love this I love this county. I, I work in this county, and I try my best to stay, my, keep my work in this county. And it's it's tough. And as y'all all know, this county's we're we're kind of going backwards. And I think we've got a case here. Some folks that don't know the truth of these quarries. Uh, the last data I seen come from Nairobi, Africa. That was what they were using to pass around. And I, I don't think that's I don't I think that's the wrong the wrong information. But I would like y'all to reconsider this idea and think about the shape of the position we're in because y'all got the future of this county in y'all's hands. And uh, we, we, need to, we need to make a kickstart somewhere. Bob, I'm sorry I took up so much time. But we need to make some progress forward at some point. And I hope this is the, a case of that. I hope that y'all consider it or some compromise or but let's talk about it. Thank y'all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Mr. Fitzgerald, would you make your way to the microphone? Commissioners, I'm Jerry Fitzgerald. I live at 1410 Willow Oaks Trail in Matthews, North Carolina. We, along with the Randall Trust, are the applicants for the proposed Meriwether County Quarry at Alberton. I'm going to keep my comments short and to the point real quick here, so I'm just going to ask for your attention. We've been dealing with this quarry issue now for over a year, and this has been very controversial and contentious from the beginning, and it shouldn't be. The quarry industry in the state of Georgia has a record of exemplary success because of the regulatory mandates imposed by the state and federal authorities controlling mining operations. There are dozens of quarries operating in the state of Georgia very successfully and provide the very basic product required for building, paving, construction materials while becoming very positive corporate neighbors to nearby residents and the host counties. Without aggregates supplied by 
quarries, the interstate highways would be dirt roads, and the housing we live in would be thatched huts. Seven of nine counties surrounding Merriweather have successful granite quarries similar to the one we are proposing. Quarries provide and supply the material for growth. Growth is coming and no one in here can stop it. The population of our country now is 330 million. By 2040, the projection is somewhere between 380 and 400 million people, and a considerable amount of that growth is here in the southeast. So here we are in Meriwether County, just south of that Atlanta Metropolitan Statistical Area, the MSA, probably one of the fastest growing areas in the southeast. But this growth opportunity has passed by Meriwether County. According to the latest census data, from 2010 to 2014, Meriwether County has lost almost 5% of its population. 61% of the population in Meriwether County works outside the county as compared to Troop County, next to Jason County, where 17% work outside the county. From 2010 to 2014, the percentage of Meriwether residents in poverty has increased from 20% to almost 24%. Almost one in four Meriwether residents live in poverty compared to Troop, which has decreased from 20 down to less than 19. Sales and use tax generated in Meriwether County in, 21, in 2015 was a million five. In Troop County, it was 10 million seven. At all other financial indices from per capita income, median household income, number of households, it goes on and on. Meriwether County ranks at or near the bottom of the list of neighboring counties. Meriwether County has been on the downhill slide for 20 years. When the mills and factories in Greenville, Manchester, Woodbury, and other communities began to close, the downhill slide began. Once prosperous, Manchester, that was vibrant, prosperous, and offered jobs and opportunities, now just a struggling community trying to just hold on. Empty buildings, storefronts, and businesses that continue to close are commonplace in Manchester. And this is not because of mismanagement or incompetence by business owners. It's because the spendable income created by jobs and opportunity is gone. The future of the county is the young people, and there is currently nothing for them here and no reason for them to stay here. I could go on and on, you get the point. These conditions not only exist in Manchester, Woodbury, and Greenville, but all over the entire county. There's not a new car dealership in the, in the county where you can buy a new car, and you gotta go to Warm Springs or Manchester to rent a motel room, that's it. The only place in the county to get a room for the night. Meriwether County has over 500 miles of unimproved roads and not one local quarry to supply crushed stone for maintenance of these roads. On occasion, in the winters, Residents have to hitch up their four by four trucks like mule teams to pull school buses out of the ruts and potholes in the roads, not in the ditches, so the kids can go to school. So here comes my group along with, with the proposal of a quarry. This location at Alberton is ideal for a quarry because of the attributes consisting of, a, of available mineable granite, a rail line, and highways to transport it. A very large 770 acre site is owned by one owner. And this size insulates and shields the community from possible distraction of quarry operation. This location is very rural, which is an ideal location for quarry. The quarry will offer jobs, tax revenue, opportunity, and the demand for supporting industries for fuel, supplies, equipment, and an assortment of peripheral companies that will further compound the opportunity of the quarry. The quarry will offer a boost to the county like hasn't happened in decades. The quarry operator will be a global corporation that will help bring prosperity and opportunity back to Meriwether County. Our group has commissioned eight professional studies comprising data and substantiation for mineral quality to, to, to minimal, if any, impact to local residents. We have, we have proven by professional studies that this proposed quarry will successfully operate not based on conjecture, fabrication, fairy tales, to, uh, 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 stories out of, out of Nairobi, Kenya, but, but factual substantiation from proven operation of quarries operating right here in Georgia. And we have the data to prove our position that this quarry will be very successful. We have offered to agree to conditions on the quarry development that were enclosed with our last letter, and those are very similar to and address the subject of the conditions suggested by staff, by staff as an attachment to its report. The quarry cannot solve all the problems in Meriwether County, but, but no one can deny it's a step in the right direction. What is really important to Meriwether County, it costs the county nothing to bring in the quarry. Nothing. We ask for no tax credits, no tax incentives, no special in industrial revenue bonds, no public grants, no land donation, no utility or infrastructure costs to be incurred by the county. Just the approval of the zoning and special use permit to enable the quarry to operate on this site. 
It is absolutely our intent to operate the quarry on this site. It is absolutely our intent to operate a quarry on this site. The county doesn't have to be responsible for regulations and laws for the quarry to operate. When the zoning, when the zoning is approved, it goes on to the state and federal agencies. Commissioners, I'm going to cut this short because I'm, I just, this is not the time we thought we'd had. Commissioners, you have the opportunity to all of Meriwether County residents, all 20,000 plus, not just the Alverton residents. They are well considered in this project by the factual evidence that their lifestyles will not be infringed upon and at the same time involved opportunity for all of Meriwether County. You also have a responsibility to consider seven job applications that were generated as a result of job opportunities for quarry positions on our website. Tonight, commissioners, the opportunity to change the direction of Meriwether County based on factual data, evidence, and proof of successful quarry operations in many other Georgia granite quarries is up to you. The time to stop the downslide of Meriwether County is now. I'm Jerry Fitzgerald. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Fitzgerald. Mr. Norman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Again, I'm Bob Norman. I'm the attorney for the applicants. We appreciate all of your uh, attention and patience in reading the inf voluminous information we submitted. Uh, I know it was a lot of information, 500 pages in a zoning binder. Uh, it was detailed, summarized in great detail in a letter of intent with that application. And then last week we submitted another letter that contained responses to contentions by the opposition consultants from our own consultants refuting what they claimed about their reports. We submitted conditions that we would be willing to agree to that address virtually all of the conditions and concerns addressed by the conditions of the sta that the staff recommended. Uh, we addressed the significantly deficient, we respectfully submit, report and recommendation by the staff uh, in, in the letter and in, in an attached uh, copy of that recommendation where we addressed every deficiency in their conclusions extremely one-sided, uh, unsupported, unsubstantiated, adopting the opposition contentions uh, about this project. Uh, and it did not provide you the information you need or the report or the evaluation that you need to make a fair and correct decision for Meriwether County uh, about this uh, proposed uh, mine, granite mining facility. I'm going to cut mine short as well, uh, what I expected to say uh, based on the time constraints. The opposition, thank you. The opposition is based on emotions, scare tactics, spread on social media, allegations by attorneys and consultants hired to oppose this uh, meritful zoning request to speculate about possible concerns from this facility uh, that have never been experienced by any of the many quarries and granite quarries in this state. There's not one shred of evidence that they've created any of the concerns that are alleged against this quarry by the opposition group. They do not give you any credible reasons to deny this zoning and land use request for the subject property uh, to the harm of Meriwether County. Um, they're using distraction tactics by bringing up things like endangered species and cultural resources and any number of other things that are all evaluated at the state level. We've talked about the extensive state permitting requirements, regulatory requirements, operational requirements that are at the state level, and, and you're not super regulators. Once again, like they did when they discussed the text amendment before you, they wanted you to become super regulators, take on the roles of geologists and engineers and groundwater specialists and water quality specialists at the Georgia EPD and address all of these concerns that will be addressed if this project is allowed to move forward. You are not issuing tonight, whatever your decision, you're not issuing a permit for this granite quarry. You're simply looking at the land use criteria and allowing it to move forward to the state permitting process where these applicants will have to meet very extensive state environmental regulations, blasting rules and regulations, air quality rules and regulations, water quality rules and regulations, uh, stormwater rules and regulations, they're extensive. Uh, and I think all of y'all know that and understand that. Uh, this, is, this is 
about a zoning approval, a request for rezoning and special use approval under the criteria in your or zoning ordinance and under the applicable Georgia law. And I'm going to talk about both in a minute. Facts. There's no question, it's indisputable, whatever the other consultants say, that this property contains very significant, uh, valuable granite resources. To quote the consultant who supervised the exploration, uh, uh, it's a massive and significant in nature and highly suitable for the mining and production of high quality dimensional stone, crushed aggregate, and landscaping sands. Uh, he confirmed that again in the letter to you uh, submitted last week. <clears throat> there, there are proven granite reserves on this property of over 265 million tons, 100, over 100 million tons of probable additional mineable, saleable tons of granite reserves. Uh, and, and in 25 years of granite production from this facility, if allowed to move forward, and if, if permitted by the state, uh, would result in net present value of over $77 million, and that's uh, net present value of net income. There's no question this is a valuable property. It's unique for all the reasons that Mr. Fitzgerald touched on. There's a rail line right through the middle of it. There are two highways on, on two of the borders. Uh, it's a one large enough property that, and you've seen this before, the diagram here, It allows for very significant buffer areas all around the property for many surrounding uses. The northern area, if you look, uh, use all my time trying to get the microphone. I hope this will, yeah, good, thank you. Uh, the Turn this up this way. The northern portion of the site uh, consists of 325 acres. Only 120 acres of that would be used for pit and plant site. Everything else is, and maybe roads and things, but everything else is buffer and overburden piles and screening buffers uh, and natural vegetation. We, I, closed the photograph to the, with the letter last week, and you can see how heavily planted in vegetation this property is all the way around. So much more could have been used, but it's a 90-acre pit area surrounded in a plant site. So it's a total of 120 acres within 325 that would be used in that area as active. All this is 80-some acres, all this floodplain between the site and uh, White Oak Creek. 87 acres of floodplain, never be touched. Whatever's in that floodplain, whether it's species or cultural resources from Indian mounds or whatever, it'll never be touched. It'll never be disturbed. <coughs> uh, this area down here uh, is, an, is another large area from the creek down to Highway 362 that'll never be disturbed, as indicated by that green area. Southern acreage is 267 acres, with only 67 acres total of pit and plant site, everything else in buffer. Now we have proposed what we think is more than adequate buffer, 100 foot uh, natural vegetated buffer, and you've seen what that consists of. 100 foot planted berm inside of that, and then overburden piles uh, around here between the pit area and those few residences up on Split Railroad. Uh, and over here between what, the small number of residences west of 85, uh, we have offered the alternative buffer that was recommended. We're agreeable to that, to do the alternative buffer recommended uh, by the staff. And that's 200 feet of uh, undisturbed area with a 100 foot planted berm inside of that. Either way, it's a significant buffer uh, for this site that will prevent more than minimal, maybe no impacts, but certainly no more than minimal impacts to anybody in the area, any other persons or property uses. <clears throat> now, the map that the opposition's been using showing all these yellow lots, those are 
apparently show individual properties in the whole area around the quarry site. Uh, many of those are not used for residential uses. Uh, many of them, as you've been talking about, are in conservation use easements. So they're mostly off the tax rolls of the county. Probably hundreds of thousands of acres, I would imagine, if you look at that. If you talk about the properties that are residential, that are actually near the site, uh, and, and these are some of the, I'm not picking on anybody, these are some of the uh, in individuals that the correspondence with you from Mr. Stack identifies as, the, as residents living immediately adjacent to the site. Well, they don't live immediately adjacent to the site by any means. First, once you get beyond the buffers, you got uh, Mr. Spangler over here whose property is halfway covered in floodplain and his home's way over here on the road back here. Uh, Mr. Coleman is, uh, let's see, down here, again, this, half of his property is floodplain. The house is way over here. Uh, same thing to the south, you've got Mr. Stovall and Mr. McConnell down in these areas. Both their houses are way down here on the other, other side of floodplain uh, from the boundary of the property. And then you've got Mr. Hurd over here who is west of Highway 85 and, uh, and then several others that were named in the correspondence who aren't adjacent property owners. So yeah, there are residents in the area, but none of them are immediately joining the property line We've got these extensive buffers within the property line. They're not going to be impacted. And that's what all the factual information we've provided you shows. Now, <clears throat> I know you don't want a long discussion. Well, let me, let me, before I get there, very quickly on the character area map. That's been heavily relied on uh, in the recommendation for denial of this application. But it's entirely being misused, I submit. In the, uh, the standards and procedures for local comprehensive planning requirements of the Department of Community Affairs, character area means a specific geographic area or district within the community that has unique or special characteristics to be preserved or enhanced, like a downtown, a historic district, an arts district, a neighborhood, a transportation corridor. Uh, it's a sub-area within, I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, the character area is a sub-area within the community where more detailed small area planning and implementation of certain policies, investments, incentives, or regulations may be applied. Well, if you look at the character area map, it's up here, but you can't see it. If you look at the character area map, the rural development uh, designation covers virtually the entire county. And the rural development designation does not allow any sort of development. So if, if this character area map is followed by you to deny whether it's this zoning application or future zoning applications for commercial and industrial development, you're not going to have any in the county. It is not the purpose under your zoning ordinance or Georgia law that a comprehensive plan, much less a character area map, be used to determine zoning decisions. That's not the purpose. It's a planning tool. And, it, and as I say, if you used it as a zoning tool here, then you would not allow commercial industrial development virtually anywhere in the county. This shows the existing, the purple, limited areas where there's already existing industrial development. Pretty much all you've got left is 100 acres in Meriwether Park. It was probably being reserved for another Kia supplier, which would be great. Uh, but it can't, the land, just like the other lots, would have to be given to them with other incentives to bring them to Meriwether County. So if you're using the, the, the comprehensive plan and the, the character map to make zoning decisions, then you can just tell people they can't file applications anymore for industrial or commercial development in the county unless it's just a convenience store. I, I do need to address for just a minute, got five more minutes. <clears throat> I don't want to give you a, a legal uh, lesson on, on zoning law. Uh, 
But nevertheless, the law is very important for you to consider in this decision. Your decision is based on the facts, the criteria in the zoning ordinance, and the Georgia law dealing with zoning decisions and how you make constitutional zoning decisions. Uh, the law is discussed at some length in, in both of our letters, the letter of intent and the letter last week. So I'm just going to repeat a little of it to put it in context. It's a long-established principle of Georgia zoning law that local governments have a duty and obligation to work with property owners to allow them the highest and best use of their property. I'm not going to give the sites, but they're all in my letters. That obligation includes local government consideration of ways in which objections to a proposed development may be eased by local government action, like the conditions that applicants have proposed to you as additions to this zoning request. Because zoning ordinances restrict the property owner's right to freely use his property for any lawful purpose, a zoning ordinance and its application to a particular property must not infringe upon constitutional guarantees of the state and federal constitution by unnecessarily or unreasonably restricting property rights. Under Georgia law, the current LDR zoning classification of this property, which limits its use for the last 35, 40 years or more, and for that length of time into the future, LDR is going to limit the use of this property to growing trees. Now, it can continue to be used for growing trees, but trees take 25 years to grow and there's no value until they're harvested. Uh, <clears throat> clearly, the highest and best use of this property, with its valuable granite resources and the other advantageous characteristics that exist nowhere else in the county, Nobody else will come and apply for a granite quarry in the county because there's no other site that has the unique characteristics of this site that make it advantageous for the development and operation of a granite quarry, a granite mining facility. Uh, going back to the law, um, this current, I'm going to address it to this project, the current LDR zoning classification of this property may only be justified if it bears a substantial relation to the public health, safety, or welfare when, it is, when those are balanced against the detriment, substantial detriment here caused to the property owner by restricting the property to that zoning classification and here to growing trees for the foreseeable future. If the zoning results in relatively little gain or benefit to the public but inflict serious injury or loss on the owner, it's deemed to be a confiscation of property rights. Significant detriment can be shown by facts which show a reduction in economic viability of a property and a decrease in land value if the property remains under its current zoning classification as compared to the value of the property of rezoned to allow a higher and better use. Again, these principles are in my last letters with all the citations to the Georgia case law that, that, that discusses the, those elements of Georgia law. In this case, we submit the significant detriment to these property owners, the applicants, from keeping this property in LDR zoning is clearly a significant detriment. And when you consider all the facts, not the allegations and the uh, fears and so forth, but consider all the facts, consider the fact that all this is going to be highly regulated during permitting and operation by the state regulatory authorities, the detriment to these property owners from keeping this LDR zoning on the property is very significant and, and very much outweighs any benefits to the public, to the people in this area, or the rest of, certainly the rest of the county. Uh, and therefore, the requested zoning approval ought to be granted. Going back just a second to the, to the land, to the comprehensive plan, got one minute left. That's where I want to end. Meriwether County is a great place to live, but it's not going to be a great place to live if the county doesn't improve its tax base and reduce taxes and provide services and have the money to provide services. It all takes an economic foundation to provide services to the residents. A granite quarry on this site, and we think we've proven this without any, any reasonable dispute, a granite quarry on this site will not change the overall small county rural character of Meriwether County. This is 700 acres out of 505 square miles. <clears throat> it will, however, bring economic development and growth and, and tax base uh, 
uh, <clears throat> and, and therefore be uh, extremely beneficial from an economic standpoint and tax base standpoint to the county. It will utilize the rail line, which is one of the objectives uh, in the comprehensive plan. The plan says through progressive leadership, we will foster economic prosperity. This is your opportunity, commissioners, tonight to carry out that vision statement in the comprehensive plan and to apply the comprehensive plan in a positive, proper, beneficial manner. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. I'll give you a little time to move out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Apologize again. Got to learn to use microphones better. I'll leave that for Don to handle. Thank you. What I'm seeing here, Mr. Stack, is again, just let me reiterate. Gene King goes first. Eddie Hinton is second. Uh, you're giving it to who? I'm sorry. Oh, you're giving it back to Don Stack. Okay, Gene. All right. So that moves me on to Mr. Eddie Hinton. Would you come forward? Thank y'all for, for y'all's time. Um, Go ahead and state your name and address, sir. My name's uh, Hall Edward Hinton. I live at 565 Riggins Ferry Road in Woodbury, Georgia. The quarry probably won't affect me as much as the folks in Alvington. Uh, I was born in uh, Stockbridge, Georgia, in Henry County. There is a quarry there. The quarry was there long before I was born. But I can tell you the damage it done to my grandmother's house neighbors around the house at least once a year growing up me and my father had to go over there uh, she lived in an older house we had to go over there constantly and level her house up every time they would blast pictures would fall off the walls um behind the house it was rock that come up out of the ground the granite my grandfather had actually dug it out with a pickaxe and and formed a depression to collect, that's, that's how they got their water from a spring that come up out of the ground. The, the spring, don't know what happened, but it got to where you couldn't drink the water. The water was terrible. The county had to bring in and put in water for her. Everybody down that road that had wells. The neighbor down the street, when I was growing up, the neighbor down the street back in them days, when they, when, uh, they dug a pool, the pool was was all concrete it, it, it didn't have liners it was a concrete pool within two years of him putting that pool in the cost of repairing the pool from the blasting of the quarry got got more than, than he could afford and he wound up just covering it up i can't uh our house where i grew up at on old conyers road the sheetrock what and, and we was on a slab foundation the the slab was cracked water when it rained real heavy water would come up through the foundation through the floor I, it, it, I'm just I understand that um, you know he he talks about um, yes it, it, it will bring economic growth to the area go over right now today go over to rock quarry road and, and look at the roads that, that are continually having that the county is having to put out money to uh to repair the roads around the rock quarry there the man, i understood the gentleman said a buffer that that they was going to have a buffer go over there on 138 now and and look you can see the quarry now there used to be a buffer there there's no longer a buffer 
they keep they gradually got the core bigger and bigger until to to you can see it from 138 going down the road i grew up in there i grew up near a quarry i don't agree with it but that's up for y'all thank you for your time appreciate your time please hold that applause hold your applause at this time, Mr. P.J. Calhoun, am I pronouncing that right? I ain't as young as I used to be. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. I was born and raised in Meriwether County in the Upper Nice District, 1933. I belong to Mount Carmel Methodist Church. I've been a member 70 years. And it's about two miles from a quarry, so-called. And I want to tell you about the danger now. They had an a explosion to get away from them. It blew rock through houses. They had to buy five houses on rows of stellar road. And... Uh, there's a, in, a rock fell at my house. It weighed about 25 pounds. And it was at the foot of a pine tree. See, it blew it straight up and it came back down because it blew sideways. It wouldn't, uh, it would have it never got there because it got a forest between me and them. And, uh, but, the, but that rock dust is a, if you ever been over there, there's a pile of rock dust, biggest stone mound. And they're supposed to run sprinklers on it. Well, that's done gone down the drain. Now, all I ever see up there is a bulldozer. And uh, that's all I got to say. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Stack. Mr. McCoy, may he approach and provide copies to y'all, please? That will be fine. Bring them on up. Thank you. Good evening, sir. And commissioners, I'm Don Stack on behalf of a number of residents, uh, Citizens for Action for Meriwether Inc., Flint River Keeper Inc., and numerous property owners, including but not limited to folks that are listed in the, uh, the booklet that we gave you, or the book we gave you. Um, as an initial matter, I, I think it's interesting that Mr. Fitzgerald and Mr. Norman both spent a great deal of time trying to assert that. Uh, this is based upon concerns in Nairobi, not, I can't even say it, Nairobi, Kenya, um, and that it's based upon scare tactics and speculation. Um, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, we have taken, as I expressed previously, and also at the Planning and Zoning uh, Committee or Commission meeting, we spent a considerable amount of time, effort, and money um, actually addressing facts as opposed to speculation, as opposed to rumors and innuendo. And we took the time, effort, to actually address the purported experts that Mr. Norman or Mr. Fitzgerald have put forth. 
And what you have in front of you, and obviously we're not going to spend, you know, the multiple literally days and days and days that it took that I've read through these, uh, but I want to tell you about what we've actually established as facts as opposed to innuendo. The first tab, and they're all tab for you, the first tab, of course, is our written comments that summarize who it is that we represent and the arguments. And like Mr. Norman says, we don't want to get into a long, lengthy legal discussion, but nothing could be further than what Mr. Norman said in terms of what the standard is in terms of, of whether or not you should rezone this property. And as it was appropriately addressed at the Planning and Zoning Commission hearing, and again this evening by the staff, the standard is not whether or not it's going to wreak some harm upon the applicant, but rather whether or not it has a currently existing value, whether the property as currently zoned has a use. Um, and the Georgia courts have made it abundantly clear that whether or not it can get more money from a different use is not the issue. In fact, the Georgia courts have even said, and I will quote, we note that in zoning challenges, the pertinent question is not whether rezoning would increase the value of the property, but rather whether the existing class, zoning classification serves to deprive a landowner of property rights without due process of law. This is his due process of law. The, that the property would be more valuable if rezoned borders on being irrelevant. Instead, the only relevant evidence regarding the value of the subject property is its value as it is currently is zoned. And so, and we, we, we put that in, in a record because I want you to think about that and, and be mindful of that. The other thing that I think we need to address is Mr. Norman's continued assertion that we're asking you to act as super regulators or that you're act, being asked by the staff to act as super, super regulators and that go ahead and trust us and don't worry about DNR is going to take care of this at a later stage in time, the surface mining folks there. Leave aside the fact that there's literally four people in the surface mining program for the entire state, at least last time I checked. So the Georgia courts, again, the Supreme Court of Georgia, have said, quote, and this is the Georgia Marble Company versus A.D. Walker, so it deals with a mining company making this exact same argument. We think that the Act, meaning the Surface Mining Act, establishes minimum regulations for surface mining that must be complied with throughout the state. But it does not prohibit a political subdivision from enacting and enforcing, through zoning regulations, different or more restrictive requirements than those called for by the State Act. So you have within your power, and that's exactly why you're sitting up there, within your power to address a zoning application based upon facts, based upon information, based upon the standards that are set forth in your code and that Mr. Garrett and Mr. Gay appropriately addressed in their evaluation. And like I said, in tab one, we lay that all out for you and we tell you how it is that the, um, the, the standards for the rezoning have been met in terms of um, you denying this this uh, application. But then let's turn to what they say their purported experts are. If you turn to tab two behind that is an assessment of what they considered their valuation or their appraisal of the of properties. And I've put, you can look at page one, and this is by the Pritchard Ball and Wise. And he says, I conclude that there are significant deficiencies, errors, reliance on reports and valuation inputs prepared by others which do not appear to coincide with Mr. Hayter's, that's Mr. Fitzgerald's opinion, expert, stated opinion and values. There are incongruent, misaligned statements as well as significant shortcomings in, in uh, parameters in the evaluation. But most importantly, if you look at page two, he says that there's no information provided in terms of the data that he says that Mr. Hayter, their expert, continues to use the word phrase tax value. Un that's quote unquote. And there's not even, that's not even a recognized appraisal term. And yet he invents this term to sit there and say, here's what the tax value 
where this property is going to be. The bottom of page two of Mr. Uh, Ball's, or the uh, tab two, says no data was provided that would allow a reader to know whether the property tax revenue for this property will increase or decrease or by how much or if taxes will stay the same following rezoning. So they go through a long discussion about that. And then our expert sits there and, and evaluates that and says that without any details, this is page three, the increased tax revenues that they say you're going to reap as a re result of this are guesstimates and are not reliable to prove if or what the sales or personal property taxes would be. In other words, it's all guesstimates. So then we go on and on and on, okay? The Hader Report, page four, does not adequately or reliably provide a meaningful estimate of the sales or sales taxes, which will, may result from rezoning and permitting the quarry. I tell you all this because the whole point is that they tell you these things, but when you actually look behind the curtain, it's the Wizard of Oz time. You look behind the curtain and there's nothing there. There's no actual facts and data to support that. So we, and to prove that, go to continue on in this report, 51 pages long, in which we addressed each of the supposed sales that their appraiser addressed, and you will see starting at page, for example, let me make sure I get the numbers right here, that on page 16, for example, he talks about distance for one of the sales. And he says it's 0 .06 miles away, 317 linear feet from the quarry. And when in reality, when you actually go look at it, it's 1,985 feet away. So he's off by a factor of six. And then he tells you no harm, no foul. You don't have to read all these. You can literally go through it. Our expert made it real easy for us. Just for all the red lines, for example, on page 21, he says that it's 422 feet, for example, on a site, when in reality it's 3,775 feet. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself, is this just sloppy or is this intentional, intentionally misleading you? So that's the kind of information. He, for example, also uses a comparable, let me make sure I get this one right, on page 25. and talks about the estate of Daisy Bone Middleton. He uses that as a comparable, completely overlooking the fact that the lady who was a widow died and was probably trying to unload the house as a result of the death of her spouse. And yet they say, no, that's a comparable. It's not. So that's the kind of info. Oh, the other thing, he, for example, that the buyer probably has a biased opinion of quarries because the buyer is in a granite countertop business. And yet that's the kind of information or data they're providing to you. So that just gives you one example. And Mr. Sniff is telling me that I need to Hurry up because we only have 15 minutes. So take a couple of minutes, you know, thumb through those. Page, then we go to our next expert at tab three and deals with, make sure I get this right, Dr. Sam Kiger. We talk about, um, you'll notice they didn't say anything about blasting. They didn't really want to talk about blasting. Let me tell you who Dr. Sam Kiger is. Instead of looking about what his conclusions are, go to the back of his report and you'll see that Dr. Kiger is literally the world's foremost expert on this. And what did Dr. Kiger do? He worked for the counter-terrorist staff for the White House, for Special Projects Office and the U.S. Secret Service to perform vulnerability surveys and analysis on several nationally prominent structures and terrorist and explosion protection. He worked for uh, the Supreme Allied Powers of Europe to their bunker for the, for the command center for NATO. And so you look at that and you say, okay, so what does this gentleman have to say? And again, without going through, but I'll give it to you in short. What he says, and it, believe me, there's more reading here than you ever want to know, but go to page five. This for, the formula, in, in other words, addressing why he concludes this, the probability of damage in 100 events is about 
and that the implies damage to the home would be almost certain during the operating life of the proposed quarry. And based upon their own statements that the blasting will occur at least twice every month, if the statement is correct, and that's all they blast, then there is a 99% probability of damage to the more than 100 homes discussed above within the first four years of quarry operations and about eight years of blasting only occurs six out of 12 months per year. Where that 100 homes come from, contrary to what Mr. Norman says, there are 100 homes within a three-quarter mile radius of this proposed uh, application. All the yellow lines there are the folks we represent. Those properties have homes on them. So to sit there and say that there's not going to be impact is just downright wrong. Dr. Kiger addresses at page six the, the information that the gentleman, Mr. Calhoun, addressed about fly rock damage and talked about that. So based upon the foregoing, blasting at the pro pros quarry has a high likelihood of damaging many of the more than 100 residential structures within one to two miles of the proposed granite pits over the life of the proposed operation. All that and it's all supported in our submittal. We then turn to the actual geology of it to address their con contention that this is in fact a viable economic solution. And again, that's at tab four. And Brian Fowler, who's been 45 years, he was the actual, uh, uh, um, uh, what's the word I want to look, geologist for the state of New Hampshire. And in fact, he's the adjunct professor at the University of New Hampshire. I think this is great. It's called the Granite State College. I think he knows a little bit about granite. He sits there and says there's just absolutely no way that they can make these representations based upon four core samples and that there's uh, the high likelihood that contrary to what they say, this is not an economically and in, in, uh, operationally feasible operation. So we didn't rely just on some guy up in New Hampshire. We actually then hired an expert here in Columbus, Columbus in Columbus State University, Dr. Clinton Barano at page uh, tab five, who tells you exactly why that is on a local basis, why the geology is such the contrary to their assertions, this is not going to be feasible. We then, of course, address the issues about noise, and you'll find it interesting that we specifically asked the opposing side to give us their CAD data as to why they could conclude what they did. They wouldn't provide that to us. So that they, at six and seven, we actually went through and had our own um, expert anal analyze this. And that is at behind page uh, tab seven, in which he says that there will be significant, contrary to what they again say, that there will be significant harm in noise levels that far exceed the World Health Organization. There are at least 20 to 21 homes projected to exceed the appropriate noise guidelines. And at least 4 to 14 will exceed the WHO guidelines for serious noise annoyance to the northern and southern quarries. Okay? That's tab 7. Then Mr. Norman or Mr. Fitzgerald want to minimize the likelihood significance of cultural resources. That's behind tab eight. And you'll see that the conclusion for that is that there are significant historical and cultural uh, sites on, on, the, uh, on the site. Um, and that, again, their assessment is um, incomplete. Uh, page uh, tab nine, um, again, we looked at he may want to minimize this, but we did, in fact, look at the, the water quality issues and the Endangered Species Act. Um, and that's set forth at tab nine that says, in fact, there are very significant concentrations of endangered and, and threatened uh, uh, biological species there. So I understand that I don't have a lot of time here, but I want you to understand fully that as we stay in, in the, in the, in the uh, tab one, you go through this entire analysis to tell you exactly why it's appropriate for you to deny this. Um, they haven't met their burden. It's not up to this community to sit there and tell all the reasons why this shouldn't be 
It's up to them to tell you why it should be, and they haven't done that. They haven't met their burden. We, we lay all that out. Um, I, I said this at the planning and zoning hearing, and I mean it again here. Garbage in, garbage out. When they give you an application that's really devoid of actual data, then you, you, you can't rely on that. The folks that we hired had no dog in this fight. They're not going to jeopardize their professional relationships and their long history of, of for God's sakes, he works for the White House, for God's sakes. He's not going to sit there and tell you that this has a 99% probability of damaging homes for someplace down in Meriwether County. He's going to put his name on that. If it's not true, absolutely not the case. So we go through, like I said, we go through the entire thing. I know you guys are, are probably tired of dealing with this, but I'm telling you, this is the single biggest decision. The sky is not falling, like Mr. Norman says. These folks have made a very conscious decision to live where they do. You've made a very conscious decision as part of your comprehensive plan for how you want the county to grow, how you want it to be perceived, and you don't want it to be another Atlanta. You don't want it to be DeKalb County. You've made a conscious decision to do that. That decision should be respected. You've got the legal basis, you've got the factual basis, you've got the practical basis for saying, folks, we want to continue the smart growth to, for this community. We don't want to sit there and sell out the immediate, the long, the short term, and the long term for fake numbers. You want real economic growth here. And yeah, sometimes that's a little bit harder. Sometimes that may take a little bit longer to develop it, but you're doing that. You've got a thriving movie industry. You've got folks who are sitting there who made a conscious decision to make those commutes because they want that quality of life. And you're going to throw that away for this? I would ask you not to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Stack. We had said earlier that we were going to have a break before the rebuttal starts. So at this time, I'm going to declare a 10-minute break, and then we'll all come back and reconvene. Thank you all. And at this time, we're moving into the rebuttal phase of the public hearing. Okay, Mr. Norman, I assume you will go first, sir. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. Uh, five minutes isn't long, but I'll cover the essentials. As to the first two speakers, Mr. Calhoun and Mr. Hinton, uh, they have got to be talking about granite quarries that were allowed or, or started before there were the kind of extensive regulations that they have today on granite quarries. This quarry, of course, will be subject to, if permitted, will be subject to all of the extensive current mining regulations that cover all of the subjects we've been talking about extensively um, and, and, by, and be regulated by those agencies and use all the current best management practices and be required to use those for granite mining facilities. Records of EPD, the Fire Safety Commissioner, EPA, the U.S. Bureau of Mines, OSHA, are all public records that anybody can obtain with a simple request. You have not been provided one single report from any of those agencies that show that the kind of concerns they allege about this proposed mining facility actually occur with modern granite mining facilities. If they occurred, the kind of things they're talking about, you would have been covered up with information like you have been in this binder. <clears throat> Instead of providing that sort of information, factual information, the opposition provides more of the same allegations that's no more factual or credible uh, than what was on the website, which was based on quarries in Ni Ni Nairobi, if you looked at the website. The proof is in the pudding. There are quarries all over the state of Georgia, just like what we're proposing, except this is more modern and more and subject to every current regulation. 
uh, none of them have caused the kind of problems they allege. There's no reason a granite quarry can't be operated on this site under current regulations with all these buffers and all under all the conditions that we've agreed to for you to place on, on your approval without impacting residents in the area or other property owners, but at the same time providing significant economic benefits to the county so that people don't have to leave the county for jobs and drive three hours to go work somewhere else. They can stay here and work and be close to family and friends like all of these people. <clears throat> Mr. Stack wants to, basically wants to litigate this zoning request as if we were in court. Well, he'll have that opportunity when he gets to the state level. You can appeal permits issued at the state level, and I'd love to see him try to tell the people at the state level who know what they're talking about and know what he's trying to allege, I'd like to see him make all these same allegations at the state level to people who know. <clears throat> now, he uses these consultants. We've responded in the letter I sent you last week. Our consultants have responded to the allegations that he's referred to again tonight. Uh, the noise report, for example. They want to use the World Health Organization uh, standard for noise acceptable noise. That's a standard for 16 hours outdoor activity. I doubt that anybody in this area spends 16 hours outdoors. The, the, the usual governing criteria that everybody uses the standard is the EPA standard that our noise expert used. Mr. Kiger, if I'm getting the name right, sounds more like he was a bomb expert for the federal government and that he's talking about U.S. military smart bombs. If he really believes what, if that report said what, it's, what, what Mr. Stack says it says, and if Mr. Kiger really believes that, then Mr. Stack and Mr. Kiger need to send that report to the Georgia EPD, the Georgia Fire Safety Commissioner, the Georgia Legislature, the uh, OSHA, the U.S. Bureau of Mines, the, Ge the Georgia and Federal Geologic Survey, and Congress, if what he says is true about blasting affecting properties two miles away. He, he needs to be talking to them in, instead, of, instead of us. And I don't believe it. Uh, blasting's highly regulated and, and you know, the, all of the, the standards are, are based on experiments and data and they're much lower than what is necessary to be sure to protect structures in the vicinity of a mine where blasting occurs. Uh, that's all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Norman. We appreciate that. Mr. Stack. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just as a couple of administrative matters, since uh, that's why Mr. Sniff gets paid the big bucks, was to make sure that I don't overlook that. Um, your your um, actual packets only have like the first 10 pages of the comprehensive plan because I figured you're all very familiar with it and I didn't feel like color copying a hundred and some pages, but from an administrative standpoint, obviously, we're incorporating the entire Meriwether Joint Comprehensive Plan and also the submittal that we've just made to you is part of the record also. Um, also want to uh, address the, the real world, which is that it's interesting because all the prior hearings and, and um, op opportunities to discuss this, Mr. Norman kept saying, well, get some real people in here. And so we got real people in here to tell you about real world experience, and then he tries to poo-poo them and say, well, it really can't be that bad because these are old quarries and they had to be permitted previously. What he wants to overlook the, the fact is that um, those operations were, may have been permitted years ago, but they have to be re-permitted every year. And these folks who came forward, who had the guts to come forward, they're not the kind of people who are going to sit there and call up EPD, call up OSHA, and say, oh, by the way, I just got fly rock in, in my yard and stuff like that because that's not the real world. The real world is that these folks have said, 
I tried. I tried to make a difference. I couldn't get anywhere with the regulatory officials, so now I have to live with it. And they're trying to tell you, you know what? You have an opportunity where you don't have to live with it. You don't have to go through what we're having to go through. So that's what I'll say about those. In terms of Dr. Kiger, it's interesting because no matter what expert we put up there, he's going to try to find something to quibble about. No, take the time to actually look at what Dr. Kiger says. He's not a, he's a bomb expert. Well, yeah, he tells you entirely, lays it out for you. He doesn't just sit there and say, trust me. He gives you the reports. He gives you the case citations. He gives you the data, all of that to say, here is why there's a 99% probability that there is going to be harm from blasting of this. Dr. Kiger and our other experts that, that I didn't have time to discuss make it abundantly clear that their contentions about no harm to the wells is absolutely baseless. They can't say that based upon the geology here. They cannot say that. They just flat out cannot say that. I don't care how many times Mr. Norman says that there's not going to be a problem or that Mr. Uh, Fitzgerald stood up and said, oh, just read our frequently asked questions number nine you know, in our website, it's conclusory. No, our folks take the time, the effort, the data, the actual analysis. They don't have a dog. They don't have an economic benefit to this. Dr. Barino at Columbus State University, he's not getting anything. He literally did this for free because he felt that you needed to have that information. Dr. Kiger is not going to sit there and ruin in a reputation that he worked for the White House, for God's sakes, and sit there and say, what? Well, I'm just, no, that's absolute nonsense. We, again, in, in our submittals, we lay out for you very clearly that every assertion they make of, of actual significance. For example, number of employees, you were going to br bring jobs to the area, and then says 30 jobs. And yet folks who know these operations say, wrong. 10, maybe at best 18. And it's those kind of misrepresentations that you've got to be made aware of and focus on. Because that's who this gentleman really is. That's really, you want to really see what you're being asked to approve. Mr. Fitzgerald had communications with community people who are concerned. Text, they say to him, we're really concerned about what you're doing, going to do here. And this is the response you get from Mr. Fitzgerald. Take a deep breath. You'll be sucking silica dust shortly. That's who your neighbor is going to be. That's who's asking you to approve that. Man's true colors. Forget how you can dress up a pig, put lipstick on it. At the end of the day, the application is by someone who doesn't care about this community, doesn't care about this county, and doesn't give a rat's behind about what the long-term impacts are. Thank you, Mr. Speck. I believe this concludes our public hearing portion. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on just a minute. Are you going to speak at this time? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Garrett and I would like to. Uh, Mr. Garrett and I would like to just address a few Go of ahead, the uh, items that were presented to you guys tonight um, from the applicant, um, and these address the conditions and the report that we had provided by staff. <clears throat> and you guys should have a copy of this in your uh, in your packets. Uh, it starts out with. Uh, uh, by overnight delivery and email. And uh, then there are uh, several appendixes that go with this. And um, the letter asserts that the county and the county staff um, basically followed the, you know, the issue and the recommendations from uh, the people in opposition. And um, that is simply not true. Uh, county staff reviewed this in detail. We did our own research. Uh, we did our own conclusions of areas of concern, and then we did review the balance of the material that had been provided. And what that material did was it actually showed that some of our concerns were shared by uh, the opinion of others. 
And um, I, I just wanted to say that. And as part of the record, to be able to show that's the case, I have a, a paper here which we're going to enter into the record. It's 913 of 18. This starts out with Rock Quarry Review. And this lists a lot of the concerns that the county staff sat down and talked about. And I would also think it's important to note that this was prior to receiving any information from uh, Mr. Stack or anyone else uh, concerning this, with the exception of the application. So this was uh, dated 9-13, and that was at least probably five days before we received anything. We'll give that to Beverly for her uh, insertion into the records. Um, we also want to just go, and I'm not going to bore you with all of it, but I do have uh, quite a bit of uh, information here where you guys can see, that everybody can see that I've reviewed this and Ron's reviewed this in detail. But there are a few things I want to uh, like to point out. Um, Again, if the state, and we keep hearing about the state's going to take care of us and permit this, if the state permitting supersedes everything, then I guess the question would beg is why do we have zoning? Um, why do we need it if, if you just have to comply with the state? Um, and I think uh, notes in here about how it's heavily regulated, I think it's heavily regulated for a reason. Um, it also indicates that this is, I'm on page two of this report, it also takes this as a unique uh, site. And I guess my question would say, have any studies been uh, uh, developed that will show that this is the only site in Meriwether County? I haven't seen any of those, and I don't know whether there's any studies that would support the, uh, this being a unique site. Again, back over on to page three. It says this is the only highway corridor located within the eastern half of Meriwether County. I, I don't think that is, uh, is a correct statement. Um, Moving over to uh, another uh, page or two here, we have uh, an issue. Uh, again, we talk about the uniqueness of this location. And again, I ask, is there, have their studies been done? And then they, there's a note that the facts demonstrate uh, it can be developed uh, for mining without causing material impact uh, to surrounding properties. And I will only say there's different opinions on that. We, we've heard uh, several of those tonight. Um, and down at the bottom of page five, I thought this kind of interesting. It says um, only 12 are residential properties, and all of, of which are four acres or more in size and insulate, uh, insulated by their lot size. I, I, don't, I don't really think that it's up to the adjoining property owners to have to provide buffers and, and other things for, for this. Um, again, on the applicant's response, um, Ron and, and county staff, and, and Ron, you chime in anytime you want. We reviewed all of this before we took a look at any of the other information provided. And then, you know, the other information provided it did, um, you know, verify uh, some of the concerns that we had listed. But there again, this is, this is all about, uh, you know, opinions. And, you know, just one opinion from an expert doesn't necessarily make it a fact. Um, Looking at a few other things, um, and all of this will be entered, but I did want to point out a few things. Um, there's always a mention that uh, in here that, well, Meriwether County is declining in population, so there's no uh, opportunity to, uh, for residential development. I will say, and, and, and I think even the applicant mentioned about we're, we're very near um, metropolitan Atlanta. And we, yes, we have declined in population over the few years, but um, I'm here, in, in my opinion, very strongly is that that trend's not going to continue. You're going to see people coming into, uh, into Meriwether County, and you're going to see uh, them building homes and, and living here. Um, Over on page nine, it says the staff report the recommendation that zoner and director and staff have assumed the role and function of noise experts, blasting experts, traffic, land use compatibility experts, largely ignoring the result of professional studies. Well, I'd like to say that, that we, the staff and, and the, the zoning director, assumed the role of review and fairly determined and reviewed all the reports for all parties involved. 
not just relying strictly on what one group said. Um, over on page 10, it, it, it talks about the revenue estimates. And uh, in the second line, it, it says uh, staff report questions the estimated tax revenues based on projected product sales in the county and the use of a slightly incorrect millage rate. I'd like to point out that that millage rate was, uh, was incorrect by 32%. Um, and also there was no mention of Freeport exemptions uh, that would also impact the, uh, the revenue coming back to the county. And down at the bottom of that page, they say, well, you know, this is, um, you know, we haven't provided any um, proof that the uh, subject property has significantly increased since 1985. We'd like to point out and also enter into the records, we do have the uh, tax digest information. And since 1985, this property has increased in value from $539 an acre to 2,332 acres today. That's a substantial increase in the investment in my terms. And that also does not include the timber and the value that would have went with the timber. Um, we talk about the comp plan and basing this on this. The comp plan was one of multiple, multiple criteria considered for this. And um, character map, same way. It's one of many that we, uh, that we considered. Again, looking at the, um, the applicants proposed zoning conditions. Now, staff proposed 23 conditions. The applicant came back with, it says 19, but I'm, I'm missing a page of something here. But anyway, on, on number two, uh, we talked about the operation hours. And uh, they stated, you know, 7A to 7P, Monday through Saturday. But they also noted rail car movements and rail car loading activities shall not be subject to these operating hour limitations. And that means if they were a mind to, um, you know, they could operate at night. They could load rail cars at night and, and move rail cars at night. Uh, their peak particle velocity, they uh, have asked uh, to be 1.5 inches per second. We had indicated in hours 8.8. .8. Uh, they mentioned again the 200 foot natural undisturbed buffer as being a, um, you know, a, a great buffer. Uh, 200 feet's not a long way. And, um, you know, staff had recommended 500 foot of uh, a buffer. Looking at Appendix A, and I promise not to, to bore you guys long with this, um, again, uh, Appendix A mentions that. It's not feasible for residential because of the decline in population. I again submit that will not continue into the future. And um, that is mentioned over and over again. Um, we mentioned... Um, respectfully, ahead, respectfully, uh, I, I need a chance to rebut this. I, mean, I will I, give you not, that opportunity if you feel yeah, like you have I mean, have they, to have the it. staff had an opportunity to make their report and yeah. so forth, and now they're speaking against the application, everything Mr. Gay respectfully is saying. And I, I didn't know if I'd known I was going to be opposing the staff, I would be, uh, I would have responded to some of this. I just want to object for the record to this sort of, this is not part of the procedure, it's out of order, and I object. Thank you. Hold on just a second. Let me confer with legal for a second. What do you think? Yeah. Nope. My opinion that the, my opinion that the county has offered way more than the zoning procedures law allows for a zoning application. So I do not think that what Mr. Gay is doing is out of order at all, nor is Mr. Norman by law entitled to uh, address those, rebut those. That's just nowhere in the zone procedure. This thing will go on forever if you don't put a stop to it. So. <laughs> Mr. Norman, I'll have to uh, defer to him. Okay, sir. That's fine.
Go ahead, Mr. And, Gay. Mr. Chairman, what I'll do is I will, I will cut this short and just make all of this a part of the record. Um, we're not objecting to the application. What we were doing was going back and analyzing some of the objections to our analysis uh, that I think were incorrectly uh, uh, pointed out and incorrectly allegations. And uh, I just want to be sure for the record that we had that as well uh, because, um, you know, a lot of the information presented in the opinion of the staff is just absolutely not factual. And what I'll do is ask that Appendix A, um, Appendix B, C, and all the way through, I think it's D, or, or all of the things in the packet. I'll just ask that all of the appendix in the packet and the other comments at the back be entered into the record uh, on behalf of the Mayor Weather County. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's all we have. Ron, anything else? That concludes your comments. Is there anything else I need to do legal? That's all you need? Okay. Do I hear a motion at this time to close public hearing? Is there a second? All in favor? Public hearing is now closed. It looks like it's in our court now, commissioners. Sorry, I don't usually need one of these. I'd like to make a recommendation to deny the application for rezoning based on the information provided by our staff as well as the denial um, from the zoning board also. I second that. I have a motion and I have second. Is there further discussion? At this time, I'm going to call for a vote. All in. Uh, all for the motion of denial. Please let it be known with their hand. Please, please sit down. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I believe that was a unanimous vote. Again, please watch your composure out there and let's get, we've got other things we've got to cover here. That brings us up to our unfinished business under section eight. And it looks like it's the appointment to the planning commission and I believe that's district two. At this time, I would like to nominate Sharon Plessy. She's a lady of Meriwether County. Uh, she worked as I was saying, I would like to nominate Sharon Bussey. She's a current employee with AT&T in Atlanta. She has worked for them for 40 years. She is a native of Meriwether County and resides in Meriwether County. So I would like to nominate Sharon I have a nomination. Is there a second? I have a second from Miss Beth here on the left. Is there any discussion? Seeing there's no discussion, I'm asking for a vote. All in favor? Okay, I believe that passed. Is that correct, Miss Beverly? Okay. Under new business. The item I see here is to be in Meriwether County service delivery strategy, strategy excuse me, to expand water and sewer service along Meriwether Street in Grantville. Mr. Gay, would you address this? Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, this is, a, is an issue where the city of Grantville is applying for a CDBG grant, and their desire is to expand water service along Meriwether Street. Meriwether Street, however, leaves the Coweta County jurisdiction, runs for a short distance, down into Meriwether County. So uh, certainly our recommendation would be to do everything we could to, uh, to be able to, uh, 
help them get that grant, and that's going to require us to do a slight modification to the service delivery strategy to show that area of our county as a service area of grant law. And I would recommend that we do that because that's going to be their best opportunity to get water and sewer services. Mr. Gay, we actually do not need to see that verbiage. We just need to go ahead and okay you to take care of that. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. I'll have to bring that back for approval by everybody. But, Hold on, um, I have one question, Mr. Gay. Mr. Gay, I just wanted to find out, is that extending the line or just covering those that are currently on Meriwether Street? I'm going to request that they extend the line, and uh, what I plan on doing is, is uh, indicating their service areas to the end of the street completely. And, uh, you know, and that will allow them to be able to expand and serve all the residents. There. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to so empower Mr. Gay? I have a motion from uh, Commissioner Threadgill. Do I have a second? I, I'm going to accept yours there, Miss Mary. We ha we do have a second. All in favor? So passes. Take care of that, Mr. Gay. Now at this time we have a report from our finance director, Mr. Bill. Okay, moving along. Report from the county administrator. No, sir. I think you guys have heard enough from me tonight. So no other report. <laughs> Amen. Let's move on now to report from our county commissioners. Is there? Uh, okay, Miss Mary. Okay, myself. None. Miss Beth. Miss Shirley. <laughs> I'm sorry. This might be a first. Well, I don't think we've ever done that. Uh, just briefly, um, this past Saturday, I had the opportunity to attend the fly-in that was done at the Warm Spring Memorial. Um, airport and it was a young man he's 17 years of age who was a pilot he put this on and came to the county to do a presentation and i want to say he did an absolutely wonderful job i'm hoping that it encourages him to do this again so once again we want to salute him for his efforts that he did and the other thing i just want to mention we've been hosting town hall meetings around the county for the past couple of weeks to talk about Splash the update on the fire department and summer referendum that's on the ballot. There will be another meeting this coming Thursday in Alvilton at the fire station at 6 p.m. Thank you. Barrister Susan. Well, I appreciate that. And certainly no executive session, is that correct? At this time, let me go ahead and cover our future meetings and I'll come back to public comment. Our November the 14th at 9 a.m. will be our regular meeting. November the 22nd to 23rd is Thanksgiving holidays. November 27th at 4.30 is a work session. November 27th at 6 p.m. will be a regular meeting. At this time, we give the public an opportunity to come up and make short comment. If there's some of you that want to come forward, there's a sheet here in front of me. You will have to sign and make your comments. Whoa, name. you got to come get this sheet, Ronnie. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead and take that back to the podium with, with you and just keep it there. And again, like you're about to do, go ahead and give your name and address. My name is Ronnie Hurd. I'm the chairman of our group, Citizens for Action in the County. Um, I don't even know where to start, but this started out back in March and April. And it's been one of the most taxing and emotionally and physically draining thing. I knew you guys feel the same way. But after seeing you guys in action tonight, I want to say thank you. My hat's off to you. And I'd like for our group to stand up and thank you. Continue to talk, speak into the mic there, Ronnie. You're getting away from it a little much. Basically what I said is, you guys did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ronnie. Anyone else? How y'all doing? Gene King at 2433 Sullivan Mill Road. I just want to say it is a blessing, not just because we prevailed, but it is a blessing to see a board unite, 
work together, you did your homework, you made phone calls. Some of y'all even took time to go look at different things, study yourself, research it. You know, Mr. Theron has gave possibility it could, possibility it can't, but he said it comes down to the board and understanding everything we're dealing with. And I, I just can't thank you enough. And I know Meriwether County has now got a message clear that we will build our county the way we want to build it. We'll build it with the right industry, the right business coming in the jobs, and we will not be railroaded by power. Thank you, Dean. Anyone further wishing to speak? Since I see no movement, I assume we're through with public comments. At this time, commissioners, do I hear a motion we adjourn? I already have a motion to second. All in favor? Meeting is adjourned. Thank y'all. <laughs>